Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to the evening's edition of Bible Class. Welcome to those who are on YouTube, Facebook, and all the other social media platform. We welcome you this afternoon. Joining us, we have Elder Harvey with myself, Elder Vinton Vaz. We'll be doing the evening's Bible Class. This afternoon, we'll be looking at the topic the church as an organization. Well, this is a continuation, part two, which I did by myself, but this evening we have our elder to join us in our Bible class. Let us pray, elder, as we start, invite God's presence with us. Let us pray, Father in heaven, we thank you for your word of truth. We pray at this time, Lord, that you will allow your sweet Holy Spirit to teach us and guide us and direct us in your word, in your truth. We pray in a special way that you will give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We pray in a special way that your Holy Spirit will lead us and that we will follow your Holy Spirit because when we teach us, when he teaches us, he will guide us into all truth. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A wonderful topic we have this afternoon, Elder, to share with the church, the church as an organization. The church in this time has become significantly important as we travel through this unprecedented time. Many people question the church. Many have joined the church. Many have left the church, and this afternoon we want to look at the church as an organization. How does one become a member? What qualifies someone to be, an, uh, to be a member of this organization, Elder? Well, for us to be a member, we have to get baptized. Yes. You know, after we get baptized, or we repent, and get baptized according to what the scripture says. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. So, Elder, many times persons don't want to join the church. What are some of the drawbacks that you see where people are afraid to join the church? They would come and visit and be a part of the congregation, but to be a member, what do you see as some of the hindrances or excuses people give to become a member of a church? People really sometimes did enemy. Try to know that it is the right thing for you to do, and so the enemy tried to distract people from coming to Jesus. Because once we give our lives to Jesus and been faithful to him, we know that in the end we will reap the good benefit. But some of the drawbacks is that sometimes people don't, they don't love God. The way how God said that we should love the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. And sometimes the worldly pleasure take us, take people up more than even the, the, the love for God. Amen. So you see it as a, the world as a hindrance. People are lovers of pleasure. pleasure. People are saying righteous living is hard to do. And many times they see Christians struggling to live right. And they are saying to themselves, boy, if the Christian is struggling, what about me? So that's one of the drawbacks I see 
where they're always saying that I want to be a member of the church, but I don't want to turn back. Turn back. And I look at it and I'm saying that it's as if they give the devil more power to keep them in sin than God, the, the, the credit, giving God the credit to really keep them from sinning. So that true. is a bad perception that people will sometimes come up with. And I think we need to get rid of that. Those who are watching and understanding, give God a chance to really make this change in you that you can be a Christian for life. And none of us can keep ourselves. It's yes. only through Christ who can keep us on this pathway. Okay, so Ella, so once you become a Christian through baptism, you believe and you repent of your sin. How would you suggest that the Christian now really live? What would he or she use to, to really instruct them, to guide them in such a way from falling? The instruction that we would give, we have to spend quality time with God. That's the first and foremost. Prayer and studying of the Word of God. We can't leave that out if we want to walk the walk and talk the talk. Amen. So in doing that, we, will, uh, we are building a relationship with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So there's a text Ella, in Matthew 16 and verse 19. It says that I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is a text Ella, I see as Christians studying the Bible, believing Christians. They sometimes church members, leaders, take this text to say whatever the church decides on on earth will be sanctioned in heaven. All churches claim this power. Do you see it as problematic that when churches will do things on earth, will God always bind these things in heaven? No, Elder. Um, when we read this text, we have to be very careful about binding and bound and loosed because our God never changed. So there are some things that church would say that they changed, and we know that God would not have changed it. So we have to be very careful in this verse where, we, where the people use and say what they're doing. They are bounding things and loosing, binding things on earth and bounding things in heaven. We have to be very careful with this Bible text. Right, Ellen, you notice in this time there are certain church, churches that will try to change certain laws. So what we are saying, things that are, there's a principle to follow where God is saying these things are immutable, they don't change. Don't change them on earth and then expect God to sanction it in heaven. We are like his laws. In Daniel it says that they will think to change times and laws. And these are some of the things as church members we have to look out for. Because perilous times are here, Elder. And the church has to become vigilant. So let's move on uh, to Matthew 24 and verse 14. And it says, The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. We are looking at some things that are like end time fulfillment, how the world is running. And the Bible instructs us to preach the gospel. And then we are to look for the end to come. Do you, are you satisfied with the preaching of the gospel as an organization, as a 
church, how you see the, the, the view of the church promulgating the gospel? Um, we are not satisfied. Yes. As God says that this gospel must be preached. And every born again Seventh-day Adventist must be preaching the gospel. We must be preaching the gospel in every nook and cranny, in every aspect of our lives. We must be preaching the gospel. If we can't sing like angels and if we can't preach like Paul, we can simply tell of the love of Jesus. We can say he died for all. Amen. The in terms of, we are looking at instructions from the scriptures. We continue in Matthew 16 and verse 18. It's, this is also another problematic text, Elder, where, where Peter, you know, Jesus had said to him that thou art Peter, Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. How problematic is this text? Eldon, what are some of the misconceptions? Is the church really built on Peter? No. You know, we have to understand this text. Yes. Because Peter is not rock. That's the first thing we have to understand. What Peter means. Peter yes. is a little stone. Yes, a pebble. A pebble. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is saying upon this rock, which is himself, we will build the church, not on Peter, because Peter is not rock. That's the first thing that we have to understand with this text. We can see Jesus as a rock when Moses, when the children of Israel were going through yes. the, to the promised land, and God told him to strike the rock and water would come forth. That rock was Jesus. Yes, not Peter. Not Peter. So That's Jesus was referring to himself, that the gates of hell cannot prevail. If the church build on man, the gates of hell will prevail. I think one of the scholars are saying, some of the scholars saying, Elder, that we are not privy to even Jesus' gesture. When he was speaking to Peter, he could have been pointing to himself. But because we don't have that luxury of being present, that Nonverbal communication is missing, and we can conclude with a certainty that Peter is not the foundation of the church. He is one of the first believers, yeah. and uh, there are some people who would claim that Peter is the first pope, which Peter himself didn't even claim to be a pope. But some persons, uh, some denomination will ascribe that, that, that um, role or that position to him. But Peter himself, it says, it is best seen when Peter referring to either Jesus himself, perhaps Jesus gesturing to himself as he spoke, right? This rock, he could have been pointing to himself. Peter see Jesus as the chief cornerstone when he spoke about Jesus. The church was founded on Jesus. Peter referred to himself as living stones, pebbles. All of us are living stones, but Jesus is the chief cornerstone. So, Ella, it's, it's interesting that sometimes people will add certain things to the scripture and make it seems as if, but many people believe. And we are here today to clear up some of these misconceptions about the foundation of the church, the church as an organization, and how structured the church is. Let's, let's move on, Ella, to the point of Scriptures carries Christ's authority. And you will look at some of this, the, the scriptures 
that speaks about, let's look at the Bible itself in 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17. That's a well-known text we normally use that speaks to all scriptures are given by what? Inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. How strong this text is to prove of the Bible's authenticity. In terms of what it lists the Bible can do, do you see the evidence of the Bible being good for doctrine? Yes. The proof? Yes. This scripture is everything what the verse is saying. We can see that. All scripture is inspired by God. That's the first thing. All scriptures. God spoke, man wrote. All scriptures. And it is profitable for doctrine. You go in the scripture and you can find things to teach. Doctrine for reproof. It reproves us from sin. It corrects us and shows the right path that we are going through. Or what that we are going or we are to go through. Instruction in right living, righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for good work, to be saved. So when we follow the scripture, according as the dictates of God, then we are equipped for good work. Uh, and good work would make, make living here on earth easier for Easy. everyone. You won't steal from your neighbor. You won't envy your neighbor. You won't kill your neighbor. Yes. You won't do anything that will harm any human being. And that's what God wants. The devil wants the opposite. opposite. And that's what people in the world must realize that there is a controversy going on. And there's, it's between good and evil. And God wants men who can stand up for the right, though the heaven falls. In Acts 20, 17 to, and, to, and verse 28, let's look at um, instructions to the elders. What was said there? And call the elders of the church. It says, take heed therefore unto yourself and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit have made you overseers. So elders are overseers mm -hmm. to feed the church of God with the faith purchased with his own blood. So it's no simple thing. It's a high price. The efficacy of God's blood. The church should live to a standard based on what it was bought with. Sure. The blood of Christ. It's a high price. So we should live highly. Higher ground we are called to. And elders are instructed at this time of the whole life of the church. Elders are needed to give direction and balance direction, the leadership of the church in this time. So in Titus 1, 5 and 7, Paul said that he left him in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are waning. You know what the scholar says they were waning? Leadership. leadership. The church was lacking in leadership of the, at that time. So Paul was asking Timothy to ordain elders in every city. Every city. Right? As I had appointed thee, the same way I ordain you to be an elder, ordain others. Right? For a bishop must be, you know, an elder must be what? Blameless. Yes. And as a steward of God, not self-willed and soon to be angry, not given into wine, mm -hmm. not a striker, not given to filthy lucre, 
What would you say about these things, Elder? What are some of the, the instructions here about how elders must behave? Well, as elders, we have to follow the word of God. We have to follow protocol. Even now we see what's going on and we have to follow protocol. Man, and we have to follow protocol. So God gave us instruction. And as bishop, as elders, we have to be blameless. We have to walk in God's way, upright. And as a steward of God, we should, be se we should not be self-willed. Meaning we should be thinking of others, not having ourselves our, alone. Right, having our own way. Of, yes, my brother. Not, but we must think of the wider community and even all your members. Even with Moses, Moses would say, God, you better you destroy me than even destroy the people because Moses loved the people like himself and not to get quick angry. to get angry. Yeah. We have to be, what's it? We have to be like, not quick to get angry. Right. And, and, and also, Elder, given into wine. When you are given into wine, you know, you don't have any self-control. You are not sober anymore. You are under the influence of a spirit, an evil spirit. And when that happens, you now become a striker. You become violent. You start to hit your children. You start to hit your wife. You start to hit your friends. And then to, to support a habit like that of a drinker, you will now give in into filthy lucre, which means money, gain, through greed, greed, like scamming. You swindle someone, you trick them, you defraud them because you have a lifestyle you want to support. No, an elder could never live like that. And be an elder. Right. So we are seeing good instruction here. If the society follows this rule, these rules, we would have a better society. True. Sure. And that's what Christianity is all about. And this is what people are afraid to come to join right. an organization, the church. Government leaders look to the church for leadership in crime and violence, in drug abuse, in family life, health ministry. They look to the church. Sometimes they cry out for divine intervention and they ask, what the are the churches doing? The church is inviting people. You and I, Elder, could be somewhere else, doing so something true. else, but we are calling men and women to a life of higher calling. calling. So God wants us to be upright and holy. God it, wants us to be like him. That's why he calls us to be holy, just as oh, he is holy, to walk the walk that yes. Christ walked when he was here on earth. And so we are calling men and women everywhere to come and, 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 and make your path straight so that when Christ comes, you will have a home in his kingdom. And to reach the kingdom of God, it is through the church. Yes. So we are not telling or saying anything that is bad. But all we are doing, encouraging us to be a part of God's family so that when time changes to eternity, we can have a home to live with our Father forever. Amen. So, Elder, we continue to look at um, some instructions, authority given in the Scripture. And Stephen in Acts 8 and verse, Acts 6 and verse 8, it says that, and Stephen, full of faith and power and great wonders and miracles among the people that he did perform. And then Philip went down into the city of Samaria and he preached Christ unto them. So when you follow good instruction, you will preach the word because your living sometimes give you the strength to preach. When you live a double standard life, it's hard to preach. It's very hard because you cannot give what you don't have. 
and people will see your preaching as in vain because there's a, 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 a double standard there. So these men had power. They had strength. They had miracles to, to perform. But the, the, as an organization, Elder, after being so steep in this scripture, let's look at the point of how do you deal with your brother's sin as leaders of the church and as members? Because they, the example outlined here can be followed by any member of the church in Matthew 18, 15 to 17. If your brother sin against you, there's a little... Uh, process to follow. He says, go and tell him his fault. All right, so he does, did something wrong. Maybe he didn't even know. Sure. So you go and tell him. Between you and him alone. Sure. And maybe we see a breakdown sometimes. Sometimes you tell somebody else first before you tell them. Yeah. And the person may wonder, why are you telling me? Why you don't tell the person? You say you are afraid to go and tell them but you are not afraid to spread yeah. what had happened between you and, you and them. Oh. So as Christians, we are saying, follow this procedure. After you go to him alone and tell him or her, then you will gain a brother if he listens to you. And he says that, but if he doesn't listen, take one or two more. Okay. So this is the case now. You invite a, a third party to come into the whole picture. And if he doesn't listen to the, you and the third party, then you take it to, to a further step where you add other persons in it, mm -hmm. you know? Because it's a with three or more weakness, then you can establish evidence to charge somebody. Right. And if he refuses, then you take it to the church, right. the wider church. And after the wider church, then you will have to take it now the church could also mean the board and the greater congregation and if he doesn't listen now you have to disfellowship him but interestingly it says and if you if he refuses to listen let him be a gentile or a tax collector that's somebody who you know you would shun in in bible days the israelites didn't like the samaritan didn't like the gentiles didn't like the tax collectors they were, they were sh shunned. They were disfellowshipped from, from society. They wouldn't invite them home, and they would scorn them. But interestingly, how do you really treat somebody who has been disfellowshipped if you want them to come back? You know, my brother, it was yesterday me and a gentleman was reasoning, and this topic came up. The way how we treat a brother, a friend, family, anybody, when they wrong you, when they sin, how you go about it. And we really have a good discussion. Because number one, even when the person is wrong, and we are going to reprimand or do anything. We must do it in love. Amen. That's the first thing. And the next point is that we are to remember ourselves. Where are we coming from and how God deal with us? So when we have those things that we, we weren't good, but yet God deal with us so nicely and clean us up and set to us that we can even go and talk to someone. When we look at that, we can say to the person, you know, I have seen. So how talk to the person nicely. And as the, the writer says, you will win the heart of the person. And if you won the heart of that person, the third person don't have to know about what happened. Amen. It's die right there, but we are not like that. We love to gossip. And when we gossip, it makes things matters worse. Right. Because everybody here, and sometimes when the thing is not even true. You can't even correct it because it's gone already. Gone. 
it's gone out already. So it's a good principle to follow as Christians before we cause things to get worse. In 1 Corinthians 5, 11 to 13, it says, But now I am writing to you that you must not associate yourself with persons who have immorality, sexual immorality, or greedy, idolaters, slanderers, drunkards, swindlers. Do not even eat with such people. God will judge those outside, expel the wicked person from amongst you. These are uh, harsh instructions, you know. There are some denomination elder follows this very strictly. Once they disfellowship, you know, they don't even tell you how they. It could be family member or good buddies. They just leave you out there to sun. Is that a good principle to follow? No. Where you just, though the Bible instructs you to, to, to do this to them, there is also another point, Elder, that I may want to look at. It warns us against idleness, right? It, it warns us against sexual immorality, greediness, and all of those things. People who are disruptive and do all sorts of things that are ungodly, you are to shun them. Take special note of someone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. But here it says in verse 15 of 2 Timothy, uh, Thessalonians, yet do not regard them as an enemy. Amen. You see the key now, Ella? Yes. Yes. Though you treat them as if they should know that they have done something wrong, but don't treat them as an enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. believer. Do you see any grace in that, Elder? Yes, a lot of grace, brother. A lot of grace we can find in this. Because, as, we, as, as I said earlier, God is a God of grace. And just as how God treats us, God wants us to treat others the same way. God don't cast us out and leave us. He said, never leave us nor forsake us. But if someone is going on and on and you even make this fellowship, that person, you still have to visit, you still have to talk, you still have to encourage because all of us are on a journey and all of us, we must love each other so that we want all of us to be saved in God's kingdom. So, Ella, how you treat a Gentile? You treat a Gentile by visiting them, trying to win them over as if it's the first you know them. The so same true. way how you just see somebody out there who's not a Christian, you do Bible study with them, you, you, you befriend them. So it seems a bit paradoxical where it's saying, shun them, but still don't treat them as an, them enemy, as an enemy and still show love to them so they can come back. So it's instructive that God is trying to say, though they did wrong, I still want to save them. And that should be our intention with all relationship. How do we bridge the gap? When we all sinned, went away, what God did, he sent his son to bridge the gap to save us. True. Though he regarded, he says that while we were what? Yet, Yet sinner, sinners separated <laughs> from God, he still came after us. We should do the same. same we are followers of Christ. Same Coming way. down to the, uh, to the finish now, Elder, uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians speaks about, or let's look at Timothy, speaks about divisive person, warn of divisive person. And he talks about them really dividing the church. We are living in a time when the church is really divided. And as elders, we are to provide balanced leadership where we guide and not necessarily show our opinions on issue, but show what God says about issues. God wants to love people enough 
for them to see the love and come back into the church, sure. you know. So, in closing, in 1 Corinthians 2, 6 to 10, you know, it, it speaks about wisdom of this world, right? Nor of the princes of this world that comes to naught. That's what Paul was saying. Howbeit I speak wisdom amongst them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world. Right. So Paul's wisdom came from God. And as elders and leaders of this organization, our wisdom must come from God. True. Not True. from our own personal biases and prejudices, right? Let's stick to the Bible, show a balanced approach. Even if God said those who were have sinned must be put to shame and do this, in this next hand, he says that we are to reach out to them. Reach out. So that's God's saving grace. Uh, we want to end on this note that no matter how bad we are, church leadership must provide a way back to the church for those who have been disfellowship, those who have been, uh, so to speak, lost in the vicissitudes of life. Let us work together as a church, as an organization, to bring back people. It, it, it speaks about, but God had not revealed them unto us by his spirit, for the spirit searcheth all things, yea, deep things of God. As we continue to do these Bible studies to, to explore the deep things of God, may we be drawn closer to him, and as we are drawn closer to him, may others see the light in us and come to worship God in spirit and in truth. Amen. God bless Amen. you all. Elder, let's invite, uh, let's, I, mean, I know invite you to pray for us to close this Bible study. Let us pray. Father in heaven, again we thank you for your word, your word of truth your word of life, your word of light. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will be with those who have listened and that you will allow your word to rest upon their heart and that they will come to know you who is life eternal, who is light. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will take the word to your people and that men and women out there who have not yet accepted you will hear your word and come to know you before it is eternally too late. Hear our cry and be merciful unto us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.